TV one, you know. Yeah, that three, two. Good afternoon and welcome to the Public Services Committee meeting. The meeting will start in 60 seconds and SIRE has been activated. I'm calling the meeting of the Public Services Committee Monday, April 11th to order at 5 o'clock. First item on the agenda would be the review and approval of minutes March 14th, 2011. Could I get a motion on that, please? Move approval, Erpenbach. Second, Aguilar. All in favor say aye. 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 And that passes. Okay. Uh, the next thing that uh, on the agenda. I am going to request a motion to move item five to the top of the agenda. I don't think you need a motion. Do I have to make no. that motion or we're just doing it? You can just do okay. it. Okay. Then the uh, first item will be amendments to chapter five, alcoholic beverages. Hi, Lori Hogshead with the city attorney's office. Item five amendments. The, the main two that, that I would like to cover today would be Memorial Day sales and the fee for our new retail liquor licenses. The rest of the items, we can uh, do those at another time since you have a full agenda today. So we will start with Memorial Day sales, and that is under Section 5-13. And this is for the on-sale dealers. On-sale dealers are also known as the retail liquor license holders. Some examples of that would be, it would be a restaurant or a bar that serves uh, spirits, wine, and beer. Um, Applebee's would be an example. Um, the Crow Bar would be another example. And right now, on Memorial Day, those businesses that have the full retail liquor cannot sell or serve any alcohol on Memorial Day, and that includes beer. The state legislature in 2010 made a change uh, to that law to give municipalities the discretion to allow alcohol sales on Memorial Day. I've had a number of requests from my applicants to um, bring this forward and to request that they be allowed to be open and serve and sell alcohol on Memorial Day. And of course that would be their choice if they wish to serve and be open or, or not even to be open. Um, and then the same thing would be for the package stores, and that's under Section 5-16. Um, right now, the package stores, and those would be the um, package liquor would be considered a liquor store or businesses that have a package liquor license, um, such as uh, a grocery store. And right now on Memorial Day, they can currently sell malt beverage or beer, anything with a malt base, but no wine or spirits. And this same change that the legislature made in 2010, um, if, the, if the city municipality so wishes, would allow um, these applicants to also sell wine and spirits on Memorial Day. Any questions? Vernon? First of all, Larry, thank you for uh, pulling out the, the proposed changes in this document. That made it much easier to, to see the sure. language. Um, what kind of what are the numbers of requests you're getting on this? Well, you know what? Every year um, prior to Memorial Day, usually the most of the month of May, I will get calls from applicants, the retail liquor, asking if they can serve. Um, I don't really track numbers, but I do get quite a few calls, and 
you know, their concern always is, well, if I just had a beer license, I could be open and serve and sell beer that day, you know, and, and their, the beer license costs $300. And they pay, you know, right now it would be 155 And they're not able to sell anything on that day. And so there's, you know, a number of concerns about that. And then I always receive calls after the day um, just saying, is there any way that this can get changed? And I always explain to them that it's a state law. Until the state law gets changed, um, we really don't have any authority to change our law. Well, they did finally change that. And so now there's um, the discretion for the city to allow them to have those sales. Okay. I, for one, if, since the law has changed, I have no issue with this moving forward. Well, do we have a uh, I would all? agree with that. Do you want us to make a motion to move those two those two pieces forward? I think that that's where we're at right now with that. I would move then that we we take these amendments that Lori has suggested for Section 513 and Section 516 and forward them as amended to the full council. Second, Aguilar. I do have a question. Mm -hmm. Can you just for the benefit? I, I remember reading, but. How do, are we doing in terms of the timeline to hit this upcoming Memorial Day? We will just make it. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> I will get that done right away. Okay. okay. Thanks, Lori. All right. Thank you. Lori, last thing on mine. Uh, have we heard from any veterans groups, churches, or anything against this? No, we have not. We have not heard. Um, the proposal at the time was for both Memorial Day and Christmas Day. Um, and a number of people were opposed to Christmas Day. And that law, that stayed the same. There, there are no alcohol sales for those types of businesses on Christmas Day. But I have not heard at all from any veterans groups or anything of that sort. All right. Thank you. Yes. And then just one other item to just um, start thinking about, and that's in Section 5-2, Classifications and Fees. We now have received our official census numbers, and that means that we are ready to offer licenses to persons on our official list, we will have nine licenses to offer. Um, currently, we charge $155,000, and that fee was set in 2001 based on the 2000 census. We now need to determine the fee to be set based on the 2010 census that we will be charging for these licenses for the next 10 years, or however long they last. Um, the fee, we have to charge per state law a minimum of a dollar per person on the census. Our numbers came in at 153,888, so you see we are at the dollar. However, in 2001, the fee was set at a dollar 25 per person um, by the council at that time. So if we chose to charge a dollar per person, conceivably it would remain the same. Um, I did figure at a dollar 25 per person. It would be one ninety-two hundred and ninety-two thousand three hundred sixty dollars, and that would be for the next ten years. Um, so something to think about where we want to set that fee, and of course, as long as it's a minimum of a dollar per person, we can set the fee where we choose. Councilor Anderson, are you looking for us to set this along with the Memorial Day? Do you want? Do you need both of these at the same time? No. If you want some time to think about this fee, I can bring this back. Um, unless you feel like you're ready to uh, make a determination on that fee. You know, I have no problem with moving it forward at a dollar twenty-five a person. And, and my justification would be: uh, there's no business that costs city government more than alcohol, uh, in police costs and, and others. So um, I would move to amend our motion by. Uh, proposing a dollar twenty-five per person for the rate for the licenses. Do you have a second to that? Second, Erpenbach. And then a question. Okay. Then, then look at as long as you're in section five dash two. Sure. Do you want to look at all of those changes that you made that you suggested there? We sure can. We we also have the discretion to, to change the fees for our one-day liquor licenses, which are now a hundred dollars. Um, for the first day and fifty dollars for each subsequent day, um, we can either leave that. You know, we do issue many, many special one-day liquor licenses, and there's organizations that apply. You know, for instance, the Sky Force Storm Stampede, um, 
pheasants. I think the pheasants sometimes do some, you know, that apply for three or four thousand dollars worth of the licenses. You know, that fee seems um, like a fair amount, you know, as far as how many actually are issued to some of those organizations. And then we also have the option to um, change the fee for the special off sale package wine dealer, and that's now set at $50. That's not a real popular license. That is for selling, if you were going to have an event and you wanted to sell South Dakota wines, and it's for South Dakota farm winery wines only, and you wanted to sell those by the bottle, um, if you had an event where you were selling by the bottle, and that's $50 for that license. I think we've only issued two or three of those since that law took effect. And then uh, the other one is for the one day beer and the one day wine, which um, were inadvertently left off the last set of amendments, so they do need to be put back on. So maybe this would be a good time to put those back on. Um, but those right now are $5 per day. Well, I guess, uh, Councilor Anderson, that's what I was thinking, is as long as we're in Section 5.2, let's clean up those um, okay. language, those missing pieces, the language errors, because there's another one um, in um, sub point two there, Convention Hall, the, where you've noted there's an error just in the number between 5 and 15. It's always been 15, Correct. but it says 5. If we could make those corrections. Okay. Do we have any others, Lori, that are like major things? To well, the, you know, if we're going to do the, I said I would keep this short, didn't I? Well, I understand if, that, but I also think that your work is well, important, and why, why make you come back if we can do this in 10 or 15 minutes? There is, and, you know? there is one that, if at all possible, would really tie in with that fee. And that one would be under, that has to do with the official list under section 5-2.14. And this was where we created the official list. And that was put into place, let's see, was it 2006, I believe. Since that time, um, you know, when we, when we put this together in 2006, there were many different committee meetings and discussions. and just trying to come up with the best plan to put this official list together. And now that we've had a chance to work with it a few years, there's one piece that's really missing. And what that is, is let's say that I offer you a liquor license and you say, I will take that license. You have 45 days to get your conditional use permit, if required. Now that has changed a little bit too, that they're not always required if it's a, a restaurant. Um, then, you, if you do need the conditional use, you have to start it within 45 days, finish it within 90. There's nothing in there that says when you have to pay for the license and purchase it. Um, I have one that's been sitting out there about three years, and really they're just buying time because they know they have to use it within two years of when they apply. So they still have not paid for it. There's nothing in here that says they have to pay for it. We never envisioned that people would just sit on these. We thought if they were on the list, it meant, I want a license, I, w I would like to open. But we do have one. Um, I'm not sure if they ever will open at this location, but they still have it pending. And we really have no authority to tell them to bring their money in and pay for this. Um, so I have added language that ties in with the conditional use permit that it's no longer automatically required. So if it is needed, um, and then I also added a section in there that they must make application and payment of the full remaining license fee within 30 days following the effective date of the conditional use permit, or if a conditional use permit is not required, they must make application and payment of the full remaining fee within 60 days. Um, it just seems like that would be fair because if they're not going to pay for it, let's move them off and get to the next person who would like one. Mm -hmm. Sue? Lori, do we just have one individual that's holding out like that? Or? No. We actually have, well, right now we have three pending. Um, one is pending because of litigation. Um, one is pending just because they're biding time. And then we have uh, Mr. Hendricks who has until... Uh, probably a couple more weeks. I've got the, the exact date in here to uh, to make application for his conditional use permit. So what would happen with those that are, I, if we made this, this change, if the ordinance was to change, would they be grandfathered in? Would it be retroactive? 
I don't believe it could be retroactive. And no, Dave says no. We would not um, be able to, to force at least the two, well, actually the three, because just because Mr. Hendricks, Hendricks goes through the conditional use doesn't mean he's going to come in and pay for that right away. But at least those future nine that we're offering, um, the nine that we would offer to the people on the official list, and there's 13 people on the list right now, um, those nine that we offered would have, would have to get those paid for, and we would be able to receive that revenue in. Thank you. Yes. And any other questions, comment, Deborah? Hi there. Is there just one more item you have, one more revision? Probably. <laughs> I could just quick do that as long as I'm here. Um, the other one is 5 8. Point one, which is restrictions on issuance of malt beverage and wine licenses. And subsection A and subsection B tied directly in to smoking. Um, and this ordinance was adopted in 2003. There was an amendment in 06, but 2003. And it just required that those businesses that, that were going, that, that wished to have smoking on the premises, they needed to have a type of an alcohol license. And that was, that was through a state law. And then what our ordinance said is they actually have to have it on the menu. They can't just have it on paper only. That they actually have, had to be able to serve beer or wine. Which um, now really is a moot point because we don't have smoking allowed in, in any of our um, license establishments anymore. Okay. Any other questions from Michelle? Okay, this is where I'm starting to feel dense. Where does it, I don't see how it ties to smoking. What am well, I missing? It just, I know it ties into smoking just because I was there when that all happened. But okay. you're right, it doesn't specifically say that. And I do, I did find um, a newspaper article when this was adopted that talked about that reference to the smoking. And you're right, it doesn't specifically say that. But they, they had to certify that they actually had it on their menu and readily available for sale. Because when the state law changed and they said in order to have smoking, you need to have alcohol, there were nine applicants that applied to have either beer and or wine licenses so they could have smoking. And that night that those were on the council meeting, they were all denied. And then the council took a recess, and they came back and approved them all, or reconsidered. Um, and then in the end, they were all approved. So there were nine businesses that had never had alcohol licensing before, but they wanted smoking. And so it did tie into it, although it really isn't written that way. I know it doesn't, it doesn't say that, but um, that is what, it, what the intent was of, of this sec these two sections. All right. Any other questions from So are we going to move on? are we going to amend 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 our motion and then How about we do a substitute motion? Yeah. All um, right. Then. I would move a substitute motion to approve all recommended language changes and set the fee at $1.25 per population and move right. this forward to the full council. Second, Erpenbach. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Lori. Okay, Thank does you. Want to pass on. You're ready for the next one. Okay. Next, we will be reviewing the pawn shop ordinance. Uh, with this, I believe we will start with. Do you want us to start with this, or? Uh, actually, I was going to. I was going to defer to have the public input. I know there's internal audit is here too, and we have some changes, also from the police department and some revisions. So, as okay. you wish. Was internal audit ready to make any statements on the revisions yet, or would you like to hold that? Okay. All right. Mr. Edelman? I was trying to grab your attention here uh, while the discussion was going on previously, but I just want to, on the, on the action that you just made, I just want to bring your attention to a couple of different things. Uh, as, uh, as a council person, I have no problem moving the two items forward that was first uh, proposed. I think there's plenty of reason to do that. However, on the rest of it, I do caution everybody, and I think since it's already been suggested you move it forward, I'm probably going to ask that's, that it be referred back to committee 
for a number of different reasons. I want everybody to understand that five years ago, before I got even dreamed of getting on the council, as a business person, I applied for a liquor license because I was going to build a restaurant uh, up by my facility, and there were no liquor licenses available at the time. The city fee for that was $155,000, which we were willing to pay. I had a national chain ready to come in and move in. I was going to spend a million dollars in building a facility, and there was no liquor license available. Beer and wine was okay, but a national chain will not move in. The chain I was looking at would not move in uh, based on a beer and wine license. Uh, at that point in time, the going rate for a liquor license in the open market was $250,000. So the comment by Councillor Brown that it does cost us a lot is true. However, the free market or the free enterprise system also dictates what those numbers will go for. At the point in time, I paid $1,500 to the city, which was a non-refundable deposit, to be put on that list, which I believe almost all of us have to do if you want to be put on the list for a liquor license in this town. There's a number of developers out there that were looking at building restaurants uh, or whatever as part of their hotels that they might want to build that require liquor licenses. In some cases, spending $250,000 borrowing money for that is very hard to come by, and it could be a tool that's that's causing people not to go forward with development of facilities, whether it be restaurants, hotels, or whatever as part of their business plan. I think by looking at this so shortly and abruptly, you may be inadvertently making a decision or recommendation that deserves a lot more public input on this. If there were a number of developers in this town that were aware that this was going to be passed, I can assure you you would have had a heck of an audience out here to be put forward some information or put forward some testimony on this issue. Uh, I really think that to take this kind of blase fair is wrong in this situation. While it is true that I applied for a liquor license, I am in line to get a liquor license, that was a business decision that I made at the time. There is an opportunity out there to get a liquor license based on 60% of your businesses in the food business. It was a state law that was passed by the state of South Dakota. Unfortunately, they set that fee at about a quarter of a million dollars, and they have yet to get somebody to apply for one under that auspice because they can't transfer it to anybody else. The large percentage of it had to be used for food. So I guess, I don't care if I have a conflict of interest or not. I just want you to understand that I really think that you need to look at this. And if it's an issue of a conflict of interest, I can discuss that with somebody afterwards. But I really think, if I don't make a, piece, a, a statement here, nobody else is going to make a statement either. Once it gets up to the council and you guys make an action on it and stuff like that, you're not giving opportunity enough feedback in this. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle? Uh, if I could just briefly respond, I think that's part of the reason we wanted it out of committee. We wanted it to get to the full council so that it, so that it would be published, so that people could have input on it, so that they could start having conversation around it. Otherwise, as a committee, yeah, we can talk about it, we can debate it back and forth, but we need to have more input from the public on it. And so I, I'm glad we moved it the way that we did. Thank you. Any other? Vernon? And if... It, when it gets to the full uh, council, too, it, I still think we should move forward it, it, with a Memorial Day piece just to, to get that out, and uh, I guess the full council can decide if we're going to hold back on those other issues. Sue, any comments? I also agree. I, I think that uh, by putting it up to the full council, now that we can have a lot more discussion in a, in a larger format forum, and still give people the opportunity to come and and make comments. So thank you, though, for your comment, Councilman Elliman. Okay, so now we're going to move forward with the pawn shop ordinance at this time. Um, I'd like to start with uh, the revisions that have been done by law enforcement. We have uh, some new revisions. I. Thank you. Uh, Keith Allenstein, City Attorney's Office. 
Uh, again, I apologize for the lateness of the revisions. Um, we just became aware of some of these proposals put forth by the pawn shops um, about uh, maybe the beginning to middle of, of last week and uh, just had a chance to, to digest some of those and, and actually make some changes based upon that. Uh, three basic changes um, to the ordinances that, we, uh, that you've previously seen. Uh, under the definitional section, um, the first one is under secondhand goods dealer. That should be non-controversial, I would think. Uh, we simply had the words computers and other digital devices in there twice. Uh, so that was just superfluous language that we uh, would ask to, or that we were planning on striking. Uh, second uh, change under that same section, or secondhand goods dealers, involves um, the exemption simply for secondhand goods dealers, uh, transactions involving goods sold on consignment, uh, based upon some language that was in the proposals put forth by the pawn shops. I don't, I'm not going to suggest that this was their proposal to do it this way, but um, it, it made us rethink how that was in there. Uh, so we've removed that exemption under secondhand goods dealers and created uh, a new section 28-5 for consigned goods. And uh, that section would read that the provisions of this chapter do not apply to any transaction involving goods sold on consignment. To the extent of that transaction that pertains to those consigned goods, so long as the sale of consigned goods constitutes more than 50% of the gross business transact transacted by that establishment. Uh, the intent that we had in, in this first exemption under secondhand goods dealer was to not bring in shops that are, that are strictly or primarily consignment shops into the reporting and holding requirements. Um, so we've tried to clean that up a little bit. Uh, it still would require uh, pawn shops, precious metals and gems dealers, um, and secondhand goods dealers um, to report consigned goods uh, unless they are strictly a consignment shop, okay, unless more than 50% of their business is consigned goods, okay. And then lastly, um, and this was, I believe, a direct recommendation from the pawn uh, shop proposals, uh, inadvertent uh, action on our part. Uh, we originally, uh, when we made changes to the required records, uh, we went from requiring strictly purchases to be recorded and then that information transferred to us and a, and a hold period and all those types of things to include any items received. Um, it was brought to our attention, or at least brought to the attention of, of the committee and then eventually to us that that would then potentially impose a, a minimum 14-day hold period on even pond items. And we certainly did not intend to do that. Uh, we, I don't think we have the authority, nor did we ever intend to uh, make it so that if you wanted to pawn an item and then redeem it a couple of days later, you wouldn't be able to for 14 days. Uh, so we have added uh, subsection 3 to 28-18 uh, to exempt from the holding period um, any item which is returned by a pawn broker to the person pawning the same. So that would allow you to go ahead and, and pawn your item, and then if you wish to, prior to that 14-day period, go ahead and redeem it yourself. Could you explain what would happen if the item was sold to the pawn shop, other than pawned? That uh, would be, that's how still, would that process go? That would still be under the 14-day period. Okay, 14 days 14 after. 14-day hold. Oh, but, uh, basically the 14-day hold period, as we've proposed, uh, is 14 days from the date that that item is reported to police. Uh, under ordinance presently, as well as into the proposals, they have up to seven days to make that report to police. So if, if it is a daily report, which many cities require, we're not proposing that they have to report daily. Um, but if they do report daily, that period would be 14 days. If they wait the full seven days to report it, which they have the right to do if they wish, uh, then that would extend that 14 days out to 21 if they waited to report it to police. And that's just to give us 14 days from the time that the police department finds out about it to check, make sure that it's not stolen, have that, have that chance to, for that item to be reported, um, but stolen by the victim and, and the police to be able to recover that item. And now when a pawn shop or a dealer 
does report an item being taken by them and this goes to the website correct correct leads online they, they electronically submit that information how do the police know that that information has been submitted if they, if they do it on a on a daily if they did it on a daily basis or if they were doing it on a weekly basis and wanted to get an item going and that should i have to check uh, uh, either Sergeant Burns response. or Captain Vandy Camp. I think I think the the Leeds Online information has a date of report on it. But okay, but you have to accurate. look in Leeds Online to to see that items have been updated, or do you get an email response from that website saying that you've they've received information? I guess is my question on that. Well, the the business is going to know when they reported, and so they're the ones that would know when the clock would start for them. Um, we would be able to go back after the fact, I suppose, and see if there was compliance or not, because we could go back and see if there was a report, when the report date was versus when the, the sale date was. But okay. That's correct. All right. Thank you. Is there any other further revision items you want to go over with us? As far as time? just revisions, no. Um, once the, the, the pawn shop personnel that are here and whoever else wants to speak, if there are any questions, I'm happy to try to answer those. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from committee? Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, <clears throat> next, I guess I would ask the pawn shop uh, group to do their presentation. Could you give us your name, please? Yes. My name is Linda Stoops, and I'm here from Sunset Pond. I'm pleased to be here. Let me see if I can get this to work. Right. And while she's doing this, I did want to mention that uh, we do have a sign-up sheet for the committee meeting, and if you haven't signed up, we'd ask that you please do. Sure, is that in the slideshow now? Doesn't look like it is. She'll help you. Okay. Looks like it's still just in the Perfect. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much. I know that when you're looking at a type of business that you don't know a lot about, possibly it can be a little confusing when you're looking at these, these uh, proposals that are before you. And I think that if I were an outsider looking at the police proposal in particular, I'd be really alarmed. You know, what kind of businesses are we dealing with here? These sound like they, you know, they're a fountain of theft or something going on in town. But I think you'll get a different view of it. We'll, we'll look at these numbers first, if I can get this to go. Okay. Last week, I think someone mentioned the National Pawnbroker Association had a quote that they said that according to their records, less than half of 1% of all the pawn merchandise in the country is identified as stolen goods. And it's kind of hard sometimes when you're looking at numbers like that to really know what that means. Um, less than 5% means that if you round it off to a percent, it's 0% is what that means. Um, if you were to compare money, <laughs> like a dollar to a penny as percents, you would have to take this penny, chop it into a hundred parts, and then pick out five of those, and then compare that to a dollar. So that's what you're talking about as far as the national level goes. Now national information is interesting, but I kind of wanted to know what's it like here in Sioux Falls, because maybe it's different. I don't have access to everyone's business records, of course, so I looked at Sunset Pond for 11 years. And what I did is I went through, and this first thing you're looking at is comparing the holds to the total tickets. So, in, and by tickets, I mean this would be an example. This is a, a transaction form that we would do with a person. You could have up to, probably on this form, five serial number type items. You could have you know, many more bulk type items on this. But, but that's what I'm talking about for tickets. 
So I'm comparing the total tickets we wrote during a year to the holds that the police put on things that were not released. When they release something, it's, it's able to be put out for sale again, so we didn't count those. Okay, the average, oh, and what I did is I, I figured it out for 11 years, and then I took those averages, and the average of the averages <laughs> is 0 .0013. That means 13 one-hundredths of 1% 1 or 13 transactions out of 10,000. So that's the amount you're looking at. Oops, sorry. I <laughs> Move your arrow a little bit. Oh, okay. There. Linda, may we ask questions as you go? You so, can, sure. I'd, do you I'm, have any sense? Uh, tickets on merchandise is very different than the value of those items. Do you have any sense of the value? Or yes, is that something that's, you're getting that's to? coming up oh, okay. next. Okay, thank you. Yep. And Good Linda, question, though. That's, Linda, that's a you continue, important thing. Could you hand us that? Could you hand it to Vernon that pawn slip, so we can take a look? Do you have one? Okay. Yeah. I just wanted you, to make sure that everybody yet? could see what one looked like. All right. Hopefully, back to the program now. Um, the next thing that I looked at was ah, did it again. Okay. <laughs> you can if you'd like. <laughs> okay. The next thing I did was what would happen if we sorted out all the renews of tickets? Now, a renew would be that you have your item in the pawn shop and you want to keep it there. So it's the same item, it's just going to stay another month. It's technically a new transaction, but really it's the same thing there. So I sorted all of those out, and if you do that, then you're left with 23 out of 10,000 are ones that, by the way, are not necessarily stolen, but are ones that are either still on hold or they've been confiscated, but we have no record that they ever were decided to be stolen. But, but even at that, we'll give them that. We'll just pretend those are stolen. <laughs> All right. If you look at it in terms of a graph, you would have your 10,000 transactions and if you look real close, right above the word hold, you'll see a couple little grease spots. Those would be the supposedly stolen items. So when people talk about making a mountain out of a molehill, we don't even have a molehill to start with here. We've got 0%. That is mathematically what this amounts to. Okay, then I did what uh, Vernon was asking about. What would happen if you took the total number of dollars invested in those holds and compared it to the total number of dollars we're putting out in pawns or buys? And when you do that, you get $16 out of $10,000, which looks like this if you do it on a graph. Um, there actually is something above the word hold there. Okay, some people still might think this is a big problem. And so what I, what I looked at then was, um, I'm not sure how many of you have businesses, but when you do inventory, there's two ways to figure out an inventory at our place. You can do it mathematically, as in I have this much invested to start with, and I added this much, I took away that much, I should have this final number. And then you go around and you do a physical count and you try to get those two things to match up. And in the real world, it doesn't happen that way. You're going to be off. The question is, how far off can you be before it's a problem? And what we found from talking to our accountant was if you had 2%, there wasn't any auditor that would ever give you trouble. They'd just say, close enough. That, that's good. So I took. 2% and just showed you what that looks like compared to 100%. And now, if you took that 2% graph 
and made it big enough so we could show the others, I've put the three figures I just talked to you about next to it. So if the 2% is statistically insignificant, I don't know what you would call those other three, but again, 0% is what they round off to. Now interestingly enough, even if you multiplied those, you could multiply that first one by three times and it would still round off to 0%. You could multiply the second one twice. You'd still get 0% when you round it off. And the other one you could multiply, I think it's three times still. So as you can see, I mean, this is, this is tiny, tiny amounts we're talking about. Okay, first impressions. The business community was not aware that the police were working on this proposal. They started apparently in March of last year. We found out, well, we were invited to a meeting, I think it was November 30th, we got an email invitation. So when we got, get to the meeting and start reading it, people are, you know, cringing at what they're seeing. The first impression that a lot of the businesses had was shock. Not everyone had had a chance to read it, and when they did, they were just taken aback. Here's what one of the major issues is. Customers who are doing legal transactions and licensed businesses were supposed to have their personal information shipped to a private company for no legitimate reason. Think about that for a minute. That is shocking. Business records also being shipped off. People were outraged, and their comment from many sources that I talked to was that we're being treated like criminals. The truth is they were wrong. The police proposal is treating these people as worse than criminals. If you look at the police department's own policy, number 1301, it talks in there about how criminal records are supposed to be handled. They're confidential, they can't be shared with anyone except um, law enforcement agencies, officers, and or other individuals in the criminal justice system. But notice that they don't bat an eye about sending our records and our customers' records off to a private company in another state. Now, Think about that for a second. The only places the police are free to send things is government agencies or government employees. There is no oversight with private companies. So when you're sending things off to a private company, there's nobody watching over their shoulder like there is with you folks. They don't answer to the public for their actions. That same policy has another portion to it says that no information that's available on the computer terminals of the police department, apparently, will be given out to the general public, including vehicle registrations. Yet last year, about six months' worth of our pawn shop's information was sent to Leeds Online. They opened an account in our name and sent it off, including people's non-public information. Think everything on your driver's license shipped it off to Leeds Online without telling anyone and without getting permission from anyone. Now, they will tell you that we can do that because this is a highly regulated business. Hmm. Okay, highly regulated businesses. That's kind of a slippery slope because when you're talking about giving up people's rights, you need to have a reason why you <laughs> would be doing that. And once you do it, you can see that they're going to not only, with, with all slippery slope things, the people that get the concession are going to go for more and a broader range, which is what this proposal reflects. We're saying that instead of giving out more power, which is what their proposal is asking for, the question should be, why are we giving out even the original concession? Buying, selling, and trading used property is not a crime. Loans based on collateral, not a crime. Storing collateral instead of repossessing it, it's not a crime. It's more a function of how big is the item. It's harder to store a house, for instance, than it is to store your ring if we're getting a loan. 
the small size of the loans, that there's nothing criminal about that. And the amount of possibly stolen property is statistically insignificant. We've already talked about that. Which, by the way, did I mention that if you look at a pie graph of what is not even looked at as stolen, that's the blue area, the black area is trying to show us what 0% looks like. And if you wanted to be technically correct, you'd actually have to get rid of either four or five sections of that black line. I just don't know that much about PowerPoint. So there's really no proven need shown so far for regulation of the type that the police have on these businesses. Okay, let's take a look at the differences between the police policy and the business proposal. I should say police proposal and the business proposal. Okay, the police proposal is building on and expanding high regulation by adding more and stricter regulation and expanding it to more businesses. The business proposal is saying there's no demonstrated need for that kind of regulation at all. Okay, and again, the police have a presumption of guilt. They are acting as if these people have all committed crimes or the businesses have committed crimes. No, we haven't. Okay, we're, ours is based on a presumption of innocence. The police have little restriction on their actions in their proposals. Ours are requesting, you know, civil rights things, checks and balances, judicial oversight through warrants. Due process has been a, been a big issue in our dealing with the police. Um, warrantless searches and seizure, and no provision for a day in court regarding your property. Property is seized and we never hear about it again. We don't know what happens to it. What we're saying is that the due process issues are handled through the proposal that we're putting it before you. Um, through the warrant process, it gives us a paper trail of what's happening to items, and it lets the judges make the decisions instead of the police and the state's attorney. Now, in talking about warrants, Mr. Allen Steen, Stein, excuse me, um, has stated that obviously the Sioux Falls Police Department is only interested in collecting evidence when they have probable cause to do so. This was in an email. Um, there's a restitution form that the police now bring when they pick things up, and they say that we're seizing these items of property, um, and it's upon a finding of probable cause. So warrants should be no problem. One thing the warrant procedure is already taught to the police officers in the DCI handbook. The steps are spelled out in detail in South Dakota Law 23A. It's not anything you have to invent to work on this. The forms are already available and they are commonly used apparently according to their policy. And since they already feel that they have probable cause, it shouldn't be a problem to talk a judge into that and having a warrant. Okay, under the police proposals, they have an equal treatment for members of the same group. They were trying to group a group of businesses together, but some of them would have special, special things and some wouldn't. Now I noticed they're changing the, the thing about the consignments. But it was written that, you know, if you were a second-hand dealer, you could do consignments without the record keeping, but everybody else would have to. Um, you know, there are different things like that. Casual purchases, trade-ins. You could take the same item, a used item, take it to one store, and if you were trading it in on something, no record keeping. Go over to another store, same item, sell it, record keeping. So unequal treatment is what that's about. We tried to make our proposal so it would be equal for all members of the same group. Okay, in their proposal, <coughs> they want to have unlimited access to records and have the forced transmission of, of our company records and customer records to this private company. What we're proposing is that the private records are protected by being sent nowhere they stay with the company, and that if you need access to it, you get a warrant for it. 
And the warrant, by the way, isn't for the entire set of records, but for the individual record. Like, you want to know about one person? Here's the records for one person. Um, okay. On their proposals, they have some protection for the supposed crime victims and a lot of convenience for themselves. In ours, we're trying to protect not only the victims of a crime, but also the customers, the businesses, and their owners, and even the police, so the police aren't put in a position of saying, well, where is the property? What did you do with it? And also protect the integrity of the cases being made. Now, arguments that they would, I guess, use are the records are as safe at your business as they are at Leeds Online. They've told us that before. Well, there's no oversight at Leeds Online. We have incentive to protect our records because it involves our customers and our business. That's not true at Leeds Online. They don't care about people in South Dakota. They'll never meet them. There's no reason for them to get involved in that. Um, we can have better access to who gets into our records because we control it in our businesses. Whenever you're going to send businesses anywhere, or excuse me, send something <laughs> over the internet, you can see that it's not going to be as safe. We'll look at two, two choices here. The first one is if the, if the record keeps, the record stays at the business place. The other one will be the records are moved from the business place. You notice that in the first case where the records start in both cases, there may be some problems, but it would be the same in each situation. And then you move them. Transmission. People would like to tell you that transmitting things over the internet is safe if it's a, a special kind of transmission. But the truth is, Encryption is made by people. People can break encryption. And if there's a reason to do it, hackers can work on that, and they can do it. Next, it shows up at the company. There's at least three different ways that you have problems here. One is, if you're a hacker and you know that there's a treasure trove of personal information, I'm talking birth dates, social security numbers, driver's license numbers, your name, everything you need to steal an identity, that would be incentive for a hacker to get into their place. Unless you can tell me that they have better protection than, oh, say, the Pentagon or the IRS, which were both hacked into before, that's not as safe as they'd like you to believe. Also, you have the idea of it's possible to have disgruntled employees working there that we wouldn't have in the first case because we wouldn't be dealing with them. It doesn't take a lot to take things off a computer. Those um, memory flash drives, I think they're called, about the size of a lipstick container. Walk over, stick it in the back of a computer, walk out the door, and how many names do you think you could put on one of those? How many bits of information? Um, also, you have an issue that you may not have thought about, but a company like Leeds Online feels they own this property. The information is theirs. Businesses use their property to make money. Now right now they sell subscriptions to police departments, different law enforcement companies. However, there was at least one story we've heard about so far from someone who's an owner of a chain who told us about a company in Minnesota, like Leads Online, that was selling subscriptions to stores. So their information went to Target because they bought the subscription. How scary is that? So are they as safe? Of course not. Now another argument people use is everybody's doing it. I don't think that's ever worked for any teenager in the history of the world. I don't think it should work in a situation like this. Sometimes the idea that everybody's doing something just means everybody's doing it wrong. We all know examples of that, and I've given you a few. Finally, it's a chance for leadership on your part, because if everybody's doing it, and you take a look at this and say, wait a minute, you're the leader of the pack. You can start a new direction. You can do it right. As far as their, the argument they might use about these laws will make it easy for us, that's only a legitimate argument in a police state, because in America, law is not based on making things easy for the government. 
As a matter of fact, it's the opposite. In American law, the government is seen as being so powerful that it's actually a threat to your life, your liberty, and your property. So American law is specifically set up to make it hard for the state. You are presumed innocent. You do not have to prove that you're innocent. They have the burden of proof, which in a debate is the hard side. They have to prove you're guilty behind, beyond reasonable doubt. We have jury trials. We have warrants. All of these are examples of how things are stacked against the state's convenience to make it hard for them to take your life, to take your liberty, and take your property. So an argument saying it would make it easy for us, meaningless in America, we'd be able to solve more crimes. Well, yeah, if you don't care how many civil rights you trample, you can solve a lot of crimes. Like, wouldn't it be nice if we could have the key to everyone's house and then whenever something comes up missing, we could just go search through everyone's house. You might, you might be able to solve a few more crimes, but is that really how we want to live? So in summary, so far we've seen no proven need for high regulation. As I mentioned, rounding off all these numbers gives you 0% as far as stolen articles coming through, at least our shop. There's a huge intrusion into businesses with these proposals with a tiny possible gain. When you're having to mark every item that's in your store, think about the bulk items. Think about CDs that the tags fall off. Think about string tags that break. Think about rings that get smudged. You'd spend all your time getting these tags right. For what? For that tiny, tiny, tiny percent of things that might be stolen. This treats legal businesses and their customers worse than criminals. It jeopardizes the information of the business and the customer. It's an indefensible trampling of civil rights for both the customers and the businesses. And Sioux Falls is better than this. I was born and raised here. I'd like to think that Sioux Falls wants to treat people in the community better than this proposal would let you. So finally, I know that you as a council are working hard to make economic development for Sioux Falls. You're looking at this entertainment center right now and trying to figure out where to place it so you can get the most development for your, your dollar you spend. The police proposal flies in the face of this because you're taking businesses that are already here, you're taking customers we already have, and you're insulting them and you're treating them poorly. I don't think that's really the direction you want to go. And finally, we feel that our proposal protects everyone concerned as well as protecting the integrity of the cases you're trying to solve. The end. Thank you very much. Any questions from the committee? Not at this time? Okay. Thank you very much, Linda. Thanks. Do we have any uh, comments from the public? Anyone like to make a comment on, on either revision? Mr. Chair, members, my name is Chuck Armstrong. I'm the Community Affairs Director for Pond America. And, uh, in the audience with me is Steve Caulfield, our Chief Operating Officer. We have uh, 23 locations spread across four states. Uh, and through that, we see a very wide uh, variety of regulation. So, but going forward, and uh, you know, folks may agree or may not agree, but uh, I want to thank you and our company thanks you for making, working towards a fair and equitable playing field. And what that means is spreading it out, the regulations, to uh, secondhand goods and precious metals. We've been working very hard on that in Minnesota in the last year. Uh, we worked closely, uh, had a very uh, uh, contentious battle, but it worked out very well in the city of Burnsville approximately a year ago. Uh, we recently worked with the city of Bloomington as they were revising theirs. Uh, again, it's bringing in that level playing field. And our belief is an example in, in a number of communities. Uh, you come to us and you're going to sell a set of golf clubs. We're going to have to hold that, that item. We report to the police, everything else. 
you go to a secondhand goods store for sporting goods and they can turn around and sell that very same set of golf clubs to the person standing in line behind you. You're doing the very same thing and yet it's, it's a you know, competitive disadvantage. So we are very thankful for that. We have been, uh, also have been in contact with your uh, police officers and working with them on some of the issues. Uh, real quickly, I know uh, the previous presenter talked about Leads Online, and we use Leads Online. A number of locations in Minnesota, I mean, uh, Wisconsin uh, communities, they subscribe to it. We've actually helped fund uh, their subscription in, uh, to help that. I want to go on the record that Pond America has and always will support uh, transaction reporting. What we do object to is the extensive fees that are charged in some communities. And that comes by uh, largely through APS, which is a Minnesota-based. It's actually owned and operated by the city of Minneapolis, uh, which is spreading across state lines. And uh, it goes into Wisconsin all the way over towards the Wisconsin Dells. Um, Eau Claire, Wisconsin has it, a number of other communities. Very like uh, AP, uh, Leads Online, where they're talking about the, the oversight, APS is oversight. It's, you know, the, it's, again, APS stands for Automated Pond System. What they do, and again, this is one of those things, be careful what you ask for, but for that type of oversight, is they charge the community 60 cents. It was a dollar up until recently. Actually, we think it was due to our, our uh, efforts in Burnsville. Uh, it had been a dollar per transaction they charged the community. That since has gone down to 60 cents. Uh, however, the communities then turn around and charge us, and our fees vary anywhere from a dollar fifty up to three dollars. We've actually had one or two cities try to raise it to four dollars per transaction. Some of that we can pass on to the customers, other times we can't. So again, when you have, and that's a control by the police officers, our police department in Minneapolis, and even if you're in Baraboo, Wisconsin, and you, and you um, do a, a transaction for secondhand goods, the city of Minneapolis is getting 60 cents of that, uh, of that transaction fee. So again, we do report uh, in those areas where we do APS, which is largely in Minnesota, and a little bit of Wisconsin, it's all of Minnesota actually, because uh, required in statute. We also re uh, download our information into Leads Online. Uh, doesn't cost us anything, but we want to make sure their database is as full as, po as possible and accurate uh, uh, for law enforcement. We have also have been working very closely with law enforcement in the communities um, throughout all the communities we work with. And that is to, uh, as we're working to raise the level of the image of our industry, um, we are working very closely with law enforcement. In fact, I'm working in Minnesota with both the Sheriff's Association and the Police Chiefs Association to really to bring in the two sides to the table. There's a lot of misperceptions on both. For instance, uh, they uh, did not recognize that all of our items go through transaction reporting uh, in, through our stores. I met with one police chief who was very vocal against us, uh, sat down with him, explained to him that uh, all of our jewelry, every item that comes into our stores goes in, in his community, goes through uh, APS and leads online, is reported to the police, uh, where he did not realize that. He thought, you know, there were certain pieces missing. However, on the reverse side, we also saw that, you know, the APS fees for law enforcement, we saw that as, uh, they're just trying to do that as a, as a revenue stream. Turns out, not really. They need to make enough to chart, pay back the city of Minneapolis. Beyond that, and they all said it, it's a city council issue. So it's a budgetary issue based on the council, not on law enforcement. So we're doing that. So we're working on these two associations to get, sit down at the table. And actually, we're going to work on a number of items. I'm maybe getting off the line. But again, looking at statewide in Minnesota, and that is to look at the expansion onto secondhand goods. It's looking at organized retail crime issues. It's looking at online um, sales. And that a lot of your stolen goods are going online, Craigslist, whatever, uh, eBay, those type of things. How do law enforcement address that? And again, probably more importantly, it's sitting at the table and talking and understanding each other and how the two business or the two aspects work. It's we're making some good headway on that. Uh, also uh, in Minnesota, we have a wide variety of hold periods. Uh, in our, throughout our communities, in Minnesota, it's done or, or community by community, it's regulated. Our hold periods for purchases vary anywhere from 14 days up to 60 days. On pond holds, it's anywhere from 60 days up to 120 days. Holding something, especially in a small store, for 120 days is, in our opinion, very excessive. It's punitive. It's also very difficult and expensive for us. So we are working uh, with state, the legislature right now to actually get a statewide standard on both pond and, and purchase holds. 
but again, we're working, that comes from working with law enforcement in the communities and, and working very hard uh, on those points. Again, I just want to emphasize that everything that goes into our store and through our either purchase or pawn goes through the system. Um, and uh, at that point, uh, Mr. Chair, members, um, if you have any questions, I'm here to, to, to answer those. Um, but we do thank, uh, thank you for this opportunity. And again, um, there's nothing in this ordinance right now that you know, hurts our business we see at this point. Um, however, um, um, but we are grateful or thankful for uh, doing the expansion of, into secondhand goods in precious metals so we do have the fair and equitable playing field. Questions, Vernon? Mr. Armstrong, thank you for being here. A sure. uh, couple questions regarding mm -hmm. leads online. I did some research over the weekend about it. What do you, from your perspective uh, as in the pawn business, what are the benefits you see of using leads online? Uh, for us, uh, for a number of, uh, from the various systems, for, you know, first one is financial. It's a subscription-based um, operation. Um, not paid by you, though, right? Not paid by us, but paid by the community. Although we have, a, again, we have stepped forward. Uh, but it's not a, a transaction-based, so it is economical uh, in that regards. Uh, it is a nationwide database, so they do spread, you know, that is a, that there is that benefit. So and if someone from a different state brings something to your pawn shop, you can plug it in and you or the police can immediately see? Actually, the police can see it. We can't. Okay. Police can immediately see that... that that item is stolen. Correct. Okay. Now, so those are the quick top benefits off the top. Yep. Any further questions? I have just a, one Certainly. too. Um, <clears throat> working with the police department in revising this ordinance, uh, one thing I did not see in the ordinance is the steps when uh, the department decides they need to confiscate an item. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I saw is that they get a receipt, and I guess I would like to to know what uh, other cities, like in Minnesota, that you deal with, when they when an officer comes to confiscate an item that they believe is stolen, mm -hmm. what's what's their procedure on that? I could. Steve, do you want to address that? Or? I'll ask Steve Caulfield that question. He's Thank dealt you. with it more than I have. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Caulfield, uh, Chief Operating Officer at Pond America. Um, basically, it's unique in every city. Um, a lot of times what they'll do is through the APS system, they'll get a, a hit on the APS system. They'll acknowledge, or they'll acknowledge the location of the pawn shop um, through, uh, through email, and then there's a hold put on that at the pawn shop. And then the police do come in. Uh, they have different forms that they use that they fill out and that we fill out. And then both parties sign. And then we release the, the property at that time. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Ch Chair, members, uh, can I add on that? We do have an occasional situation. We hold firm on this. Uh, on occasion, you do have a uh, a law enforcement agency that will feel that, uh, you know, there's established procedures and how that works, what Mr. Caulfield just explained. Uh, but there's an established procedure. For however, you know, for example, we've had in one community, there's a neighboring one, the police officer says, well, just release the, you know, release the item to the, this person who, you know, it's, it was theirs, it was stolen, so just release it to them. We don't do that. We make them go through the process uh, and they make sure it's proper paperwork because it's safe for everybody. So we don't allow shortcuts in that regard, but, uh, Sometimes it's not, they don't like it that way, but it's the best, it works best. Thank you. Any, any other comments, questions from the committee? Do we have any other public comment on this issue? Sir? If you could give us your name, please. All right. Um, my name is Brian Deitz. I'm with the Last Stop CD Shop, um, considered a secondhand store. So not currently covered under some of the, the ordinances that are in place. We don't have a hold period on, on the stuff like he had discussed. Um, I, I moved to Sioux Falls 16 years ago, opened this business. Um, it's grown 
quite well for us. Um, at this point, to have to hold the items like it's suggested um, and to tag the items would be a huge financial burden to us um, because of the volume of business that we do. Um, we'd have to add at least four full-time employees to do that. Uh, what we buy is mostly just, I guess, what the pawn shops consider bulk items. Um, CDs, movies, video games. Um, they're not unique items. Um, they're, they're mass produced. Um, and, and we are happy to work with the police department replacing those th items for people if they're stolen from them. Um, it may not be the exact same one that was stolen from them, but it's the exact same item. Um, when we buy stuff, we have, uh, we don't have a, a, I guess we individually list every item that we purchase and, and how much we pay for it. And, and we also have a record of everything that we do not purchase. Um, it's as specific as if it's a widescreen movie or a full screen movie. Um, we could tell that by going through our records, which the police always have access to. Um, but uh, in the last two years, we've purchased two properties in the cities of Sioux Falls for our businesses. We're going to be opening one on Friday. Um, I don't know if you've ever made a business plan, um, but adding four more employees has never crossed my mind. Um, we have proposed ways to... to um, get these items back to people, things, things that are stolen from people, to the police department. Um, just to give you an idea of the volume of stuff that we go through, um, I don't want to get into it that much, it's a you know, business, but um, two weekends ago, it, we purchased over 5,000 items in those two days. Um, to have to try to tag those somehow. I don't even know how we'd do that. Um, and storage is a huge issue, yeah, um, to have to hold on to those items. Um, I guess I'm not real prepared here, but I certainly ask there are any questions if anybody has any. Okay. Any about questions from the committee? No questions at this time. Okay. Thank you right. very much, you. sir. Any other public input, comments? My name's Brad Tams, and I'm here on behalf of Lewis Drug. I just wanted to go over um, why Lewis Drug is in favor of these ordinances coming into place and giving us, in the police department, the ability to track things. Um, that we're not previously able to track. Um, to give you guys some <clears throat> idea as far as losses that we see in the in the six Sioux Falls Lewis stores in 2007, <clears throat> we lost $38,000 in video games and gaming systems and approximately $92,000 in DVDs. And that's in the six stores in town. Um, <clears throat> after having those significant losses, we took steps where <clears throat> we installed cases um, now if you go on to a lowest drug, um, our DVDs are locked up, our game systems are locked up, and 90% of our video games are locked up to prevent the theft that we were seeing. So <clears throat> not only are we incurring expenses in the theft losses, but also we incur expenses in having to buy the cases, as well as having to add additional staff to <clears throat> assist the customers that come in and not want to buy this merchandise. Um, A couple stories and some things that we see sometimes with these secondhand stores. Um, <clears throat> on December 21st, um, at one of our Lewis stores, uh, we detained an individual who had, had taken approximately $160 worth of PS3 and Xbox games. Um, <clears throat> two weeks later, on January 7th, um, at the same store, 
we detained the exact same individual <clears throat> who came in and this time took $60 worth of PS3 games. Um, <clears throat> in both cases, um, this individual was prosecuted, but the second time we actually asked him, you know, what, why are you taking all these video games? What do you do with them? And <clears throat> he indicated that um, he hit <clears throat> various um, businesses in town and when he would take them, then he would bring them to these secondhand goods stores and sell them. And he indicated that he was making approximately $800 a month in stealing this merchandise and then turning it over to the secondhand goods stores. Um, so it is a problem, and we see it quite a bit. Um, in fact, uh, one of the loss prevention agents in town today um, <clears throat> ran into an issue where three individuals came into his store and <clears throat> took uh, seven PS3 games. Um, he detained one of the three individuals. The one that he detained did not have the merchandise, and one of the other two did. Um, <clears throat> when they left and we were able to review what happened and figured out which one actually had the merchandise, um, the loss prevention person followed their car for a short time, at which they pulled up to a local secondhand goods store, grabbed their Lewis bag, and began to walk in the door when they noticed that our loss prevention person was there. Obviously, they turned around and didn't go in the store to sell the merchandise. But it is a problem that we do see in town. And I just wanted to take a few minutes to give you our side of the story. Well, thank you. Any questions? Committee? Thank you very much. Thank you. I guess I have a question for the city attorney. Did you have a question? Go ahead. I can wait. Can I call you Keith? Yes. All right. right. <laughs> Keith, I guess I'd like you to explain to me what the uh, process is when an officer is going to confiscate an item from a pawn shop. Well, it's going to depend. I mean, our, our ordinance doesn't talk. <laughs> you need to make a distinction between two types of, of searches, first of all. There are administrative searches and there are criminal investigative searches. Um, as far as uh, the way this process works uh, on the administrative side, uh, that's what our ordinance addresses, is uh, the area of closely regulated businesses, uh, having the records transmitted to the police department, having the records open for inspection, having the article available for inspection. Those are all administrative, and there's volumes and volumes of case law that talk about how that's proper without any warrants or anything like that. Um, in fact, there was just a, a opinion by the South Dakota Supreme Court um, on March 30th in the area of taxidermy talking about that very same thing. And the state laws read almost verbatim with our ordinances on those administrative type searches. As far as a criminal investigative one, the, the only problem I have with putting the language you have to have a warrant in there uh, is one, it's not necessary. Uh, because if a warrant's necessary, the law will tell us a warrant is necessary. Secondly, there are all kinds of exceptions to the warrant requirement. Uh, most of the uh, pawn shops uh, consensually turn this over, um, which they, I suppose, if, the, if it says there's a warrant requirement in there, I suppose they could still do that. But um, requiring a warrant uh, in the language of the ordinance is not something for our ordinance to address. That's something that's already addressed in state law. It's already something that's addressed in in case law, both in this state and uh, United States Supreme Court interpreting the, the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. That states when and when you, when you do need and don't need a warrant. Um, if the police uh, absolutely want to take something strictly as part of a criminal investigation and they want that property, uh, they either need a warrant or they need an exception to the warrant requirement. Okay, generally, it's done consensually because most pawn shops, once they've been informed by the police, assuming they have some basis to believe so, would, I assume, not want to be in possession of that stolen property. Um, and so uh, most of it's done on a consensual basis. Um, putting the language you have to have a warrant in there would take out other possible exceptions. Plain view. If an officer walks in and sees a stolen item that that officer has probable cause to believe is stolen out on the floor, constitutional law says that no warrant is required. And that's been the law for, for years. Uh, exigent circumstances, it could be anything, some sort of an emergency situation where the police need to act without a warrant. All those things have to be justified after the fact, potentially. Uh, but, to, to, but to require the language that a warrant is required on every single uh, seizure by police 
eliminates the multitude of exceptions to the warrant requirement which have been established over years of case law. So uh, it's going to be either a warrant or it's going to be an exception to the warrant requirement if it's for a criminal investigation. If law enforcement wants, however, to come in and inspect an item or uh, inspect the records for an administrative purpose to make sure that they are complying with these ordinances, there are volumes and volumes of case law that says no warrant is required ever in that type of situation. Okay. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to answer this or if it may be uh, one of the officers. Could you tell us maybe in the last year how many items have been confiscated from pawn shops and out of those confiscations, how many times did we not have a warrant or did we have a warrant? Do we have any of that data or may that be available later? You know, I, I don't know and I guess it depends on what you mean by confiscate. If, if you mean by the police taking it, you know, uh, that isn't necessarily a seizure, like I said. Um, I don't know if we have those numbers now. If, if they take the item, what, are you, what do you want to call it then? Because well, they're taking the item, I call that, that's a seizure. Wouldn't you? If, if it's done, if, if it's done by if it's done by consent, um, then it's not. Um, if it's done either pursuant to a warrant or pursuant to a warrant requirement or, or uh, not pursuant to a warrant uh, without a warrant requirement, then yes, that would technically be a seizure. Okay. But as I understand it, the multitude of these things are, are voluntarily turned over. But. Hi, Sergeant Matt Burns, Property Crime Sergeant for the Police Department. I can tell you that we've had. Uh, since roughly this time, uh, middle of May of last year, approximately 40 items which we've received NCIC hits through Leads Online. That system has worked very much like it's designed to work uh, for us. And of those items, I don't have exact numbers which we've uh, confiscated. Some of those items could potentially uh, still be on hold yet, but I, I doubt that. We, we allow for that in our policy. Okay. Thank you. Vernon? Actually, um, First of all, Keith, I, in just some of my own research, I saw, too, that uh, the Eighth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals said the police do not need a warrant to seize items that are in plain view in pawn shops as well. Correct. Um, and I don't know if this is for you or, or Sergeant Burns, but part of it was answered. You said there were 40 items. Was that in the last year? Correct? Any idea of the dollar value of that? <clears throat> I don't have those exact figures on the dollar value, but I can tell you that those items range from uh, smaller items such as an individual CD or DVD, perhaps an MP3 or iPod, all the way up to multi-thousand dollar items such as jewelry, um, stereo equipment, systems like that. So it spans spans the range of uh, from not so much, uh, certainly a class two misdemeanor range all the way up to a felony. And is that a large part of the personal property that is uh, stolen in Sioux Falls? Are you able to put it into context for me at all? Sure. As you likely are aware, we see an increasing, increasing amount of those uh, personal music devices, uh, uh, MP3 players, many, many iPods taken. Uh, as that technology progresses and comes online, we're starting to see the iPads and things like this. Uh, the Garmin GPS type units, those are very highly pilfered item in Sioux Falls, um, if you look at the broad scope of our reports. certainly. Those, those come out of vehicles, those comes out of uh, residential burglaries. We continue to see that, and as you might imagine, uh, those things you would find in a residence, jewelry, other personal items, televisions, uh, DVD, uh, Blu-ray players. And those are just from you know the, the residences and the vehicles, and certainly we have the thefts from businesses as offered by the representative from Lewis. I believe in your annual report you, you show that there's a dollar value to how much personal property is stolen in Sioux Falls. And what I'm trying to get at is what percentage of that is made up of items that, that have been sold in pawn shops in Sioux Falls? Right. And, and I don't know that exact number, but I can certainly get that. And if you that could, you. that'd be Absolutely. helpful, I think, for this discussion. Certainly. Any other questions from the committee? Thank you. Thank gentlemen. you. Can I just add one thing? Sure. Up here, so save it for uh, a lot of a lot of talks been made about percentages, how much percentage uh, items go are stolen that go through pawn shops. Um, that's not a new argument. Uh, the Tenth Circuit de dealt with that argument um, in the case of S and S Pawn Shop versus City of Del City um, back in 1991. The argument was the very same there that less than one tenth of one percent of items that go through pawn shops are stolen. Uh, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals rejected that outright for two reasons. 
One is that's still a significant figure to them. Um, and secondly, um, <coughs> there is, well, actually three reasons they cited. Uh, they <coughs> said that, in effect, we would be required to strike down uh, inspections of pawn shops because the statutory scheme has succeeded in controlling property theft. So the statutes that we have, the ordinances we have in place are working. That's why, if the percentages are low, that's why they're low. Um, and so uh, we need to also address these other areas where we have no figures from secondhand shops. Uh, this ordinance does not make drastic changes to pawn shops. Uh, that system is basically working. We need to bring in secondhand stores. Secondly, um, the Tenth Circuit said that the United States Supreme Court in Berger, in approving these types of warrantless types of inspections and administrative procedures, didn't get too tied down in. I'm not saying it's completely irrelevant because it, certainly it's relevant, but didn't get too tied down on percentages again because all those show is that the, the procedure that's in place is working. So I just want to caution on that. Keith, that reminded me of one other question. Uh, explain to me this standard, and you addressed it last time you were before us too, in terms of closely regulated businesses. What is that? Who fits into that? And who describes that? Um, well, the, the courts do, ultimately. Uh, State versus Clagler, with that case that just came out on taxidermy shops, that was one of the um, issues in that is whether taxidermy shops were or were not a closely regulated business. Um, uh, to try to simplify it, there were 45 pages of, of the opinion here, so I'm certainly not going to talk about all 45. But Can you give me a sense of what other, so obviously pawn shops are in that pa standard of closely regulated business. What other kinds of industries are in that? Uh, auto salvage uh, yards, um, these taxidermy shops, um, I'm trying to think of, of any others. Basically, um, the idea is that uh, a closely regulated business um, is typically requires an acquisition of a license, the maintenance of records that are open to inspection, uh, the assessment of fines or loss of license or criminal penalty for regulatory violations, and are similarly extensive regulation in other states, and that it has been that way for a substantial period. Uh, I, I think that the question of whether pawn shops are, by court definition, a closely regulated business was decided I would say a hundred years ago. Um, I, this is this is that's they struggled a little bit with taxidermists and, and ultimately came down to the conclusion uh, in a three-two decision that they were a closely regulated regulated business too. I, I don't you know, imagine that they would have any struggle at all with with determining whether a pawn shop or secondhand goods dealer uh, is a closely regulated business. And then also, if I may ask, what uh, I noticed in both proposal that, that you put forward and also in what the businesses were asking for, the license fee was dropped by 50 percent from a hundred dollars, I believe, or fifty dollars to twenty-five. I'm curious what the thought process was. It was just for the pawn shops. Uh, before there was a disparity between pawn shops. There were only two license fees before. Uh, pawn shops was fifty and the sec or the uh, precious metals and gems was thirty-five, I think, or twenty-five. Um, our, our continuing theme throughout this is one we're not trying to generate revenue by this deal, okay? Uh, and secondly, our, uh, another theme is that we were trying, as best we can, we have to make exemptions and exceptions out there for some types of things, but as best we can, we want to treat everybody the same. Um, and that was, we could either bump everybody up to 50, uh, or we could bump or take everybody down to 25. Um, you know, uh, I was, we had a false alarm ordinance in front of the council before that had a, a fairly small, uh, regulatory fee that would apply to alarm users uh, that went into committee based upon uh, among other things that $25 I, I I suggested that we we go down I didn't want to get hung up on this 25 extra $25 being something that was that was going to bog this thing down it's not to generate revenue it's simply to uh, know who's doing this and and to have a, a licensing uh, issue that that uh, holds them accountable thank you mm -hmm. Michelle? A couple of questions, Keith. Um, and again, we're, we're still kind of in that fact-finding mode that committees are in, and I, I just really want to, I'm trying to clarify some things for myself personally, and we're obviously not voting on anything tonight. Talk to me about the tagging system that is in, is in the new, in the proposed ordinance. If I, if I own a pawn shop or a second-hand store and I'm buying CDs, and I put it into my computer that I bought, you know, 10 Bon Jovi CDs and five whatever, blah, 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 blah. Is that not enough or do, 
do we have to put some kind of sticker or some kind of something onto that? What's the thinking between just keeping a record of it on the computer and actually putting a physical tag on it? Uh, there's a couple purposes to that. And, and again, uh, I don't have the ordinances. The other cities that do this is, this is not something we created. Right, I understand uh, An idea that. that we invented. Uh, but the idea is, is twofold. Uh, one is to be able to recover the specific property that was taken from the person. That in a normal transaction may or may not be uh, that important to the person. Uh, the other thing is, is if uh, the idea behind this would be it was it's designed to uh, be able to identify items. If if all they put in uh, is that a certain DVD was taken, uh, we don't know if that DVD came from whom it came from if it was associated with other DVDs that were reported. If I have 10, if I have 10 CDs or DVDs stolen from me, the fact that all 10 were turned in at the same, in, in the same transaction and are identifiable with that might be proof that those are mine. Uh, if they're not identified as all part of the same transaction, the fact that I have, you know, uh, a specific uh, DVD uh, or CD stolen from me and, and one shows up in a pawn shop, uh, there's no way to tell whether that came from from me or not. Oh, suddenly it clicked for me. I may have written my initials on the back of all my boxes that were stolen out of my car. And so if you find one of them in a pawn shop, you might find all 10 of them that were stolen out of my car. Am I, am I thinking that properly now? Well, not only that, but I think uh, you'd probably be in the minority of people that try to put some unique identifier yeah, on no, their property. Yeah, no, I don't. But I'm, that's why I couldn't make sense of it. I'm like, I don't keep track of that stuff. Does it have a specific, specific crack on it or what? I don't know. My question then, too, is about the hold period. Um, can you talk about the thinking behind that? Again, I'm just looking for where we're coming from, what's, where are we headed with this? Uh, the hold period is, is designed to try to give police, the whole, the whole purpose of, of the hold period is to try to make sure that property doesn't disappear because there are certain types of property that aren't replaceable. Um, some may be and some may not be. Um, so the idea is to try to grab onto that property before it's um, gone again. Uh, we don't require uh, that pawn shops uh, give us the name of the person that that uh, they sold items to. Uh, they could have, they could obtain that with a warrant, but that could change hands uh, numerous times before the police. The 14-day hold period uh, is up from 10 days. I know there's some been some discussion uh, that it's as many as 21. Again, I want to emphasize that that's up to the individual business about how timely they are in their reporting. Uh, but but going from the 10 days to the 14 days. Uh, is simply because of, of the nature of things these days. We're a very mobile society. Things aren't necessarily stolen and pawned uh, in the same cities, so it might take longer to discover those things. Other states might have, or other cities might have different reporting requirements. Um, people travel. Uh, it's not unusual to be gone for, for you know, more than 10 days uh, now. And, and if you come back and, and report uh, your items uh, if, if you're on a two-week vacation and you come back, those items are gone. Uh, so we tried to pick a compromise. Nationally, the average is about 30 days. Uh, we're still below half of that with our with our proposal. So uh, we wanted to increase that a little bit to try to to try to capture that property before it uh, disappeared again. And if I could, one more, um, Councillor Brown, enlighten enlighten me on this. So if if I um, stole an iPod and sold it on eBay. Is eBay going to run that through Leads Online so that they can find it first? I'm not sure I understand that specifically, but I don't think they have access to that. Uh, the, the eBay, does eBay report? Uh, what, what I've found in my research is that, that eBay, which is, of course, the world's largest uh, marketer or pawn shop, they use Leads Online to uh, track information and track um, who's selling it and whether items are stolen or not. Plus, there's a consumer pr protection benefit of it. Um, if Sioux Falls Police uh, use Leads Online, I as a consumer in the com community can go to Leads Online and register the serial number of my television set or my electronic devices and uh, have that added protection that when it is stolen then they can track it back to me. So there's some consumer protection for citizens in Sioux Falls uh, based on services Leads Online provides as well. Okay, and I just want to emphasize that what I was trying to say is that uh, I just don't want there to be a a consensus out there that every private business uh, can have access to the information that's on Leads Online. Um, that is restricted to law enforcement agencies, and that's part of the contractual agreement. 
uh, that, that Leads Online requires is that you are a law enforcement agency to have access to that system. So you may have a limited access that you can register your piece of equipment or you can specifically check to make sure your item wasn't stolen, but that doesn't, I, I just want, what I was talking about was just general access to the system. I'm not familiar with all the products that they, they have out there for the consumer. Good. Okay, any other questions from committee members? I have a question then. Mm -hmm. um, if this ordinance does go through um, and we add the <clears throat> CD shops, the consignments, or whoever gets added on to, the, to this revision here, the added cost of those businesses, if they don't have a computer, to be able to, to install a computer, get, get uh, hooked up properly to uh, transfer their information because these businesses will be required to transfer their information also to leaves online. Am I correct there? Consignment shops. That thinking? The idea is no on consignment shops, but yeah, the secondhand goods dealers. Okay, correct. so like the last stop CD shop and them, they will be able, they'll have to turn in all of their sales items or just for consignment or used items uh, because they do sell new also. No, it, this, is only, this is only items that they're receiving. They don't have to, they don't have to report sales, uh, and they are actually already presently reporting, even though they're not required to. They're, they've been reporting for some time now. Are we going to have some type of grace period to allow these companies to uh, be able to get caught up with the pawn shops as far as being connected and understand the workings of leads online? Will the police... I work with those businesses to train them how to uh, operate. Yes, and I and the only the only business or businesses I don't know if there was more than one. I know there was one specifically that that had some concerns because of a lack of knowledge of computers and uh, use of the internet. Uh, I know Sergeant Burns went out there and sat down with that individual and and helped them through the process. And I think it was fairly painless for that individual. So. Um, I'm not aware of any other uh, individuals that have expressed that concern about those costs or the or the reporting requirements. Certainly, the police department would would uh, uh, help out and in that extent to, to explain the process and and how to get set up online. And, and as uh, Pawn America uh, indicated, this is uh, this is different. I mean, it's 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 something that the police department basically pays for. Um, doesn't doesn't pass that cost on to the to the pawn shops through a transaction fee. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? One more shot. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Any thank other you. comments, statements from public? Mr. Chair, in the interest of time, I'm not sure what your goal is with this with this proposal at this point. But do we want to kind of defer it to our next committee meeting? Let some of this kind of settle out a little bit. Hear some more from yeah. folks, or what well, are you thinking? Well, I, I think that we need the time to actually digest all this information and everything. So I would say this will carry over to the next meeting, is okay. what I'm thinking. That's what I was thinking too. I mean, some of it we've just received. Some of it we've only had a few days. Um, I would appreciate that if we could kind of continue it. If we did that, then the ordinance just stays as it is. The as it is right now, okay. until we approve anything to send to the council. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have anyone else that we need to hear from that would be suggested by committee or staff? I have had a couple phone calls from some individuals who are not in town at this time and uh, would like to comment on this. So I think if we hold this for one more meeting that those individuals will be able to make their statements also. Then if I might, I know there are folks that have made a special trip to come down this evening, and perhaps we need to hear from those folks that are here this evening as well. That's your direction. I, just very briefly, I'm, I'm Dean Naser, and I was here before um, on behalf of uh, Sunset uh, Strip Pawn and other pawn brokers and some secondhand stores. Um, I don't want to get into the legal arguments that uh, Mr. Allenstein uh, had, and uh, I do want to comment on one thing that is suggested by what I've heard here today. You have had a reporting requirement in place, and that reporting re requirement last year produced only 
40 hits, 40 hits out of all of the business that was done in the city of Sioux Falls. And that reporting requirement has saddled those businesses with unbelievable amounts of overhead just to get those 40 hits. Now, those businesses, if you were to examine those 40 hits, how many of those crimes would have been found anyway and voluntarily turned in anyway and would have been revealed uh, just by the police stopping in and saying, hey, have you got any kind of a uh, item that we're looking for? Okay, and so what are we doing? What are we doing? Uh, it's like shooting a fly with a cannon to try to saddle these businesses with that kind of overhead. You're going to take a legitimate business um, and you're going to make him hire four people in order to run his business. You're going to end up putting him out of business. And it's a burden on everybody. It should be worth it. That's what's suggested to me by this evidence today. Legalistics aside, this is absurd. And taking, taking the, um, the people, 99.95% of the people, according to the statistics that have been presented to you, are innocent, and we're sending their most private personal account information to a place they don't want it to go, they haven't consented that it go, and they don't even know it's going. And we're going to allow that identity to be at risk. Now, I just got last week an announcement from a national bank that they'd been invaded and their information had been taken. And I am supposed to watch out for my identity. Is there any privacy left? Is there anything at all left that we should be protecting? Administrative searches, like Mr. Allenstein said, those searches are supposed to be to see if you are in compliance with a regulatory scheme of record keeping. They are not permitted to be a subterfuge for a criminal investigation. The cases have shot that down uniformly across the country. That you are not to set up an administrative scheme that can be used as some kind of a guise, an excuse to go into a pawn shop and look for an item you already know is stolen. Those kinds of warrantless inspections are like an electrical inspection, like a, uh, uh, an OSHA inspection to make sure that people are in compliance. And if you happen to see a violation while you're doing one of those, that's okay. You can then invoke uh, sometimes even warrantless seizures. But most of the courts require you to get a warrant at that point based on that and come back and seize the item. Now, Mr. Allenstein said to you uh, that the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals just upheld a warrantless search. No, they didn't. I've got the case right here. The search was by consent. The search was by consent. The owner of that, uh, it was a, a, a uh, it's PPS Inc. versus Faulkner County, and um, it's an Arkansas case. And that owner gave permission, laid the pawn or the uh, gun ticket out on the counter. Uh, the uh, officer told him that uh, he was making an administrative uh, type. Uh, search, they said, no, it's not an administrative search. This is a criminal search. Had, and they, they in as much as said, as uh, if he had not consented, they would not have permitted the search. Now, what they did permit was the seizure, which is different than the search. A seizure doesn't involve privacy. A seizure involves the right of possession. And so they permitted the, the uh, seizing of it because the owner of the shop had identified the item as uh, stolen. He had given them all they needed to know that it was stolen. So then it's appropriate to take it. 
and put it into the criminal system. But you have to have a warrant on a criminal investigation in order to, uh, to, to search and then seize the item. Now, there are some things like plain view. Plain view, uh, you, if you are where you have a right to be and you see an item and it's clear that it's stolen without handling it, without looking at it, unless the owner were to give you permission or the pawn shop or whoever, you can't handle it. I've got cases where they, the guy had to turn it over to look at it and identify it, and they said, you got to get a warrant. So don't think for a minute that warrants are outdated when it comes to these kinds of things. Admittedly, if you want to see if a business is in compliance with your regulatory scheme, it's okay to, to let somebody do that periodically and regularly because they know it's coming. They should know that there are going to be some kinds of inspections. But when it comes to these kinds of things like we're talking about, the danger of this ordinance is that it is commingling the, the thievery, the investigation of thievery, with the administrative search. And, and that's what the problem is. This is not a purely administrative ordinance, okay? And so I'm, I am suggesting to you that you be that bastion of freedom that we need because this is dangerous. This is a very dangerous expansion of this ordinance to take this and impose it on private businesses and uh, not require warrants. And it is going to result in an abuse of administrative searches. And that's what should be protected against. Okay. Any, any questions? Thank you, Mr. Nazer. <clears throat> Move to adjourn. All in favor, say aye. 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 Um, with item three, I'd like to defer that till June 13th. Uh, that will allow our chief clerk to be back and address that issue. All in favor say aye. To aye. Aye. Public services is dismissed. Next meeting will be May 9th.